Napoleon, the movie, is a failure. I think we can all kind of agree that the movie was not great. It was kind of meh, right? When you look at the box office, it says the same thing. If you look at the audience scores and the critic scores, if you really care about what they say, they all say the same thing. Six out of ten at best. All those things up there. You can go watch all the stuff in the description, guys. You can go watch Angry Joe. You can go watch Blocky Through History. You can go watch History Legend, okay? There's a lot of guys saying, eh, it's just not very good. I was one of the people that said, hey, I really want this movie to do well. I went into the theater thinking that this movie would do very well and would be very good. But I also had a little cautious optimistic optimistic because, you know, Ridley Scott is not exactly known for playing very true to history. But again, if the story is good, people will theoretically at least learn something about Napoleon. I might go out and actually learn more about him. But this movie failed on everything, right? So let's break down why it failed. One, the storyline is not interesting and it jumps everywhere. We are trying to cover Napoleon from his start, right, all the way to Waterloo. This movie starts in 1792, all the way to 1815. Actually, it goes all the way to his death in 1821, if you really want to be that. And then, my God, dude, it, it's too much. Um, and it's just not interesting. The storyline just isn't interesting. Like, that's the biggest crime of all, if you have a movie, and the storyline's just not interesting. The really movie should have been called Napoleon and Josephine. That's what it should be called. Napoleon... And Josephine, that, that's basically what this movie is. But they don't even make that good. Like, everyone just kind of forgets that that thing is even happening most of the time, right? Even though it's, like, the central tenet of the movie. <sighs> Two, it tries to cover too much in one movie. This is the same thing that happened in Midway. If anyone remembers Midway, that, that, sh that, he that movie tried to cover Pearl Harbor... Doolittle Raid, Battle of the Coral Sea, all the other engagements in the Pacific, and then finally Midway, which was the, what the movie was supposed to be about. It tries to cover all of that in one movie, and it doesn't do it all very well, right? It also tries to cover China, too, after the Doolittle Raid. But, again, too much for one movie. Everyone was, op was saying this. I was saying this when the first trailer came out. I said, well, this is a little too much. I don't know if they can pull it off. Or are they just going to cut bits out? And, oh, yeah, they cut a lot of bits out. It it's just too much for one movie, right? Like I don't know how you're supposed to cover Napoleon in what you can't. It's physically impossible. This movie demonstrates it, right? This movie should have either been Napoleon the Rise and then the next movie Napoleon the Fall, or Napoleon the Rise and then a middle movie and then uh, the Fall of Napoleon. It would have been better. You could have saved money and tested the waters if this movie was gonna work instead of blowing all of the money and not getting a sequel because it's not gonna happen with this one. <sighs> and three. It fails at making people interested in Napoleon. I watched this with my brother and mother uh, at the movie theaters um, a day after this movie came out. And let me just say that they were not exactly the most enthusiastic about watching it. And then when they came out of it, they were like, eh, yeah, it's okay. And that's about all I got out of it. My brother made the comment of, wait, weren't they just friends? Right? At one point when Napoleon meets with Alexander and then they straight just jump to the invasion of Russia. He's like, wait, weren't they just friends? I'm like, yeah, they skipped three years. That's how jarring it is for normal people. Unless you're a historian, and we'll get to the, the historical inaccuracies being a reason why this movie failed. But even if you're a historian, you have to be like a historian to watch the movie to understand what's going on. If you're a regular person, lame person, you don't know anything about Napoleon, you're going to walk away from this movie and be like, I don't really know what just happened. Because it tries to cover everything and doesn't do any of it very well. And then finally, the historical inaccuracies. I mean, yeah, it's the bottom of this list, and I'm a historian. And I'm saying, look, Kingdom of Heaven was one of... I like it. It's a really good movie. It's horribly is, is historically inaccurate, but it's a good movie. Right? A good movie can overcome historical inaccuracies and at least try to get people interested in the subject, right? Like, everyone today knows God wills it from that movie, right? And they're actually interested in some crusading uh, history, and they might actually go out and watch some stuff. Not with this one, not with Napoleon. The amount of historical inaccuracies are just out the wazoo. And then Ridley Scott saying his very famous line, which I'm going to play up there right you now. Know, uh, I, I would say, how did you know where you're that? Right? 
when he says stuff like that, and then he asks you to know about Napoleon before you come into the movie theater and, like, you know, be able to understand what's going on, and then at the same time saying, how do you know you weren't there, right? They, that's, that's just demonic. I, I don't know what else I could say. Like, I'll link all the, the videos I got on this in the description. I watched all of the stuff before I even made this review or after action report on Napoleon, but please go watch them. They There's reviews for you guys. There's what he said at History Hilt, which, by the way, Dan Snow's a very good historian. Now, that History Hilt video is really just blowing smoke up um, Ridley Scott's ass because he doesn't ask any really hard questions, but I understand. You know, you got to get paid, right? But... I mean, you can see his mindset, really Scott's mindset on, like, how he views historians and historical, how they limit him. Let's put it that way. How they limit him and they don't exactly tell the full story, in his words. But, I mean, those are the real four reasons why Napoleon failed, right? So, with that ran out of the way, let's get to the good, the bad, the meh, the good, the meh, and the bad. And then we'll get to the storyline. So, the good. There are a few good things about this movie. One. The costumes are fantastic and historically accurate. They're done very beautifully. They're done very well. You can actually see 95th Rifleman. You can see all the British guys. You can see the French pretty good. You got all the cavalry, all the Russians, right? All the Austrians are all dressed up pretty accurately. That is one thing that really Scott is really good at, or his costume department really is good at, is getting and nailing the costumes very well. Even in Kingdom of Heaven, you don't see people wearing plate. Right, they're all wearing chainmail, what they which will which will what they historically wore, right? It, the costumes are good. They're usually good in Ridley Scott movies. Usually, I'm not talking about the duel, but you know, <sighs> you see changes in Napoleon throughout the years. You actually do. He he becomes a little more psychotic, if that's any consolation. Um, even though he doesn't physically age, because Ridley Scott wanted. Joaquin Phoenix to play Napoleon and he wanted it above all of his heart you can't actually see the young man versus the old man it just kind of looks like the same person going through life differently it's, it's probably the best he could have done with that oh yeah and then last good thing is Talleyrand's around he's around he doesn't very do much but he's around yeah this is good I guess the meh the personal story of Napoleon and Josephine Okay, you see changes throughout Napoleon and Josephine throughout the whole movie. The acting was fine. The age difference is jarring, okay? But it's okay for what they were trying to do there. It should have been the other way around where Josephine was older than Napoleon, because she was historically. But what what are you going to do? Anyway, it's meh at best. It's not like a good storyline. It's a meh storyline, and then everything else brings it down. And then we get to the bad. The bad. The four hours that this movie is supposedly going to get a release of, the four-hour version, is not going to fix this movie. Okay? Let's talk about that. A four-hour Justice League from Zack Snyder, right? The Zack Snyder released, really released Justice League. Yes, it made the movie better. Did it fix its inherent problems of Justice League? Not really. Did the box office care? No. That's why there's been no more Justice Leagues. That's why they're having to redo, redo the whole thing again. The whole, what is it, DCU, DC verse has to be redone now. That's why they got rid of Superman now. It's because the original movie theater, movie in the movie theater failed. Box office, in the box office, right? That's all that matters when you're trying to make movies. At the bottom end of the, at the end of the line, if the movie doesn't do that well in the box office, it doesn't get remade. It might become a cult classic like Dread 2012, right? Where we all like it now, but in the box office, it did not do very well, right? Napoleon did not do well in the box office. And a four-hour version is only going to be watched by people that, one, like Napoleon... And two are historians that like it, right? So you're already getting a very subset of people to watch it. But you've already pissed all those people off by saying your very famous line, which I'm going to put you know, there. Uh, I, I would say, how did you know where you then? Right? And when he says stuff like that, then you already drive away the historians and people that are interested in Napoleon, right? So who's going to watch this four-hour version? It's not going to fix the movie. At best, it'll patch it up to make it watchable, 
right? But it's a four-hour movie. Unless you're like, like, people like Gettysburg, and they like, well, I don't say they like, but they understand the sequel afterwards. I can't even remember the name of it. Wow, it's blanking on me. I'll put it up there, the, the four-hour version of that. Um, but people, like, historians like that stuff, right? But it's boring. Four-hour movie's boring. A four-hour movie, right? Normal people are not going to watch a four-hour movie. It's just not going to happen. So I'll stop ranting about that. But There is no Marshall Lands, which is a personal deep wound to me. There, so one, he was his best friend, Napoleon's best friend, right? Just not in the movie. Two, there was not him being wounded at Aspen Isling, right? May 21st, 1809. He died from infection nine days later, right? Napoleon visited his best friend, Marshall Lands, every day and wept at his death, right? These are quotes from Napoleon. What a loss for France. What a loss for me. Then he wrote to his wife, right? Louise Antoinette Lands. And he said, the marshal has died this morning of the wounds he received on the field of honor. My pain equals yours. I lost the most distinguished general in my army and a companion in arm for 16 years, whom I considered my best friend. Okay? Just all cut out. Like, that's a really good storyline thing that you could have done. If you were going to do this movie covering all this history, you could have at least focused on someone else's little sides. If you're going to do Josephine and Napoleon, fine. Do, do that, and then have his best friend. Like, because there's no other marshals. Marshals don't even show up in this movie. Like, I barely recognize Nate, but we'll get to that. But Why? Like, you could just have his best friend and Josephine. I understand cutting out all the marshals, right? I really do. You couldn't, you couldn't even have one? Like, his friend? His best friend. And then he dies and have it be a very powerful moment. And then you see the actual turning of Napoleon, right? And he starts getting war weary. And he starts not being himself after the death of his friend, which is really what happened, right? Story, nope. Didn't even, didn't even bother. Didn't even bother. Didn't even bother mentioning that Lance was a thing, right? Napoleon is not Napoleon in the movie. Like, he has none of the charisma. He doesn't talk to the army. He doesn't he doesn't plan anything. He's not strategically minded enough to, like, show how he wins, how he beat every allied army, that every army that he faced most of the time, right? He did lose sometimes, but not usually, right? None of that. None of that is shown, okay? All that Napoleon is basically reduced to is a bumbling, whining person that begs for Josephine's, Josephine's affection. That, that's all he does. I mean, for the whole movie, it's like, Napo oh, Josephine's having an affair. I must abandon my men in Egypt and blink. Oh, oh, Napo oh, Josephine, you must see my new son. Oh, Josephine, you must do, oh, Josephine, oh, Josephine. Like, that's all the movie is. None of the charisma of Napoleon, nothing. The actual Napoleon that was there. So, just... Whatever you had in your head, no, Napoleon was just, Napoleon needs Josephine, that's it, right? <sighs> I've already covered how this movie tried to cram too much into it. None of Napoleon's marshals are mentioned. In the credits, they actually mention Mar Bur Marshal Berthier, one other, I couldn't even read that fast, and then Marshal Ney. Marshal Ney is actually at the very end of the movie. And I, the only reason I know it was Marshal Ney, because it didn't actually say Marshal Ney, the only reason I know it's him is because he led the cavalry charge at Waterloo. That's the only reason I knew it was Ney. He doesn't look like Ney. Doesn't have the orange. Doesn't have the orange hair. Doesn't have any of his features. Just, just some random dude. This is Ney. Eh. What is? That's it. Right. That's all the marshals. All of his marshals never mentioned. <sighs> the story has bad pacing issues. Right. As I've already covered, wait, weren't they just friends when Napoleon meets the Tsar Alexander, right? That's just the whole movie. You jump from the beginning of France, then you jump into the Battle of Toulon, then you jump to Egypt, then you just jump everywhere in the story. Every three years, three years, three years, five years. It just continuously does that, and it's jarring. Like, there's no, like, you would be like, wait, how are they the same age, and how is this affecting something that happened three years later or, like, three years earlier? And that's just the whole problem. It just continuously jumps. It's way too much. Right? Oh. And the best part is, if you actually go watch that History Hilt thing um, about... Which I recommend you actually go do. I'll put it up there, right? Directors think that the audience will get tired of battle scenes or just sex scenes. And they don't like to do it. Right? 
it's the same thing that D and D did in Got. Right. Everyone remembers season eight, seven and eight. Right. The endings of Game of Thrones, the Battle of uh, Winterfell. Right. Where oh, we must put a pause on the action because too much action in the battle sequence. People need to have like a simmer down and then more action, right? So then you get the Arya Stark going through stealth mission in the fort, making no sense, and then more action, right? Because they need a break. It's the same thing with Ridley Scott. He's like, oh, well, those are just battles, you know? The movie wouldn't be interesting. And I'm like, no, that's not how that works, right? Lone Survivor, okay? We've already proven this. We've proven without a doubt the movie can be all battle with dialogue, and they work. Lone Survivor, Fury, you could even say American Sniper, kind of, right? They've already been done. Lone Survivor is a prime example. It is just one big battle. And it's dialogue. And it works. And it worked in the box office. But no, of course not. Why? They can't do that. You, it doesn't even have to be all battles. You could literally just have people talking, like him interacting with his best friend Lands, him interacting with the marshals, going over plans. Like, it can all be interesting if you can do dialogue well right? Napoleon is not a non-interesting dude. He gets, he flares up, he has rages, he yells at people, right? All of this is recorded, could have done it. But no, the battles are too non-interesting. Must have very few, only for a few minutes. <sighs> but that's the bad, right? If you're still here, I appreciate you. We're going to get to the storyline now. And then we're just going to keep using Ridley Scott's um, How Do You Know? Were You There? thing. It's going to keep popping up every time I mention something that he thinks happened or wanted to put in there, right? So, the movie starts with Marie Antoinette dies with Napoleon watching. You know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where he you He wasn't there? really there, right? But that's a minor issue. Then you get to the Siege of Toulon. The best battle scene in the movie, okay? It's Napoleon... It's charging a fort, doing it semi-historically accurate, and, and semi-historically, all right? That's the best battle scene we get in this whole thing, right? That's it. And there is no Napoleon wounded by a bayonet because... You know, uh, license, right? I, I would say, how did you know where you then? Right, so that doesn't happen by the British soldier. He gets promoted to Brigadier General, and then it jumps all the way back to France, Robespierre, the Robespierre scene actually was quite funny. I will admit the Robespierre scene is quite funny. You're all guilty. No, you are guilty. And then he tries to shoot himself in the face. It is quite funny. Historically accurate? Probably not, but again, that's not even the biggest deal with it, right? It's quite funny, but it leads nowhere. Then it skips to Josephine's release, right? They're releasing all of the prisoners after uh, Robespierre dies, right? All the minor nobility, which Josephine was a part of. So they're released... And there's a party that Napoleon shows up to, and then basically a romance ensues for a good just 30-something minutes of the movie where he tries to flirt with Josephine, and he tries to date her, and then he gives her, her son a sword from his father, which he just picked up randomly from an armory, right? It's it just that. Then we get the 13th of Brumaire, or Vermeer, right? The whiff of grape shot. Um, it's not a bad scene. It shows royalists, but you wouldn't know they're royalists. You don't even know why they're rising up, and then you have Napoleon there, and then he shoots this whiff of grip shot and kills a lot of them. Um, it's not bad. It's not a bad scene, actually, but it only lasts like two or three minutes. Then we go back to the marriage of Napoleon and Josephine. We get the drama that all of that comes from, where she ha might have be having an affair with some French dude, and then he whines, and then all that stuff, right? Then we jump from there. We just skip all of Italy because... You know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where you then? Then we go to Egypt, where he's in Egypt, and he's fighting the Ottomans slash Mamluks in the Battle of the Pyramids, and a cannonball it hits the top of the pyramid in 1798, and... You know, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where you then? So after that, he does actually have a distress where he is unsure that his, like, because a general is telling him that, hey, your wife's having an affair in France. He's like, no, no, that couldn't be possible, right? 
So then he just abandons Egypt and goes back to France, not mentioning the political situation, not mentioning that he's cut off, not mentioning the French fleet is destroyed. No, it's all because Josephine's having an affair. I must return. Because... You after know, I, I would say, how did you know where you After been? that debacle, we get more drama ensuing with her. I honestly, I really can't even remember what happened. I, I remember he threw her out. She whined. They made up. Little sex scene. Blah, 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 blah. Leads nowhere. Right? Then you have the coup of 18th Brumaire. Right? In 1799. The scene is actually quite good. I will, will say that that scene is really good. Mostly because it's just actually not one shot scene but like you get my drift on this like a one shot scene um where he's like oh, they arrest people they go there but they're like no we must have we must make these people consul blah 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 hey you can't take power get him and then they try to get napoleon and he runs away he runs outside the guards are like guards they try to kill him and they're like what do you want us to do about that and then his brother's like if i thought he would threaten our our, our constitution democracy republic i would kill him myself get in there and then all the guards come in and then he's like shall we vote it's actually a pretty good scene it's one of the very only good few scenes then after that uh napoleon his family wants napoleon especially his mother to get well really it was to find out if he could have a kid which at this point because historical thing has been thrown out the window because you know uh, license, I, right? I would say how did you know were you then right he already had bastards by this time so we already knew he was fertile so the scene didn't really happen like this but he makes his mom makes him sleep with someone that dude she gets pregnant and then it is josephine that is the problem as to why he's not having kids right so that's what happens there um meanwhile the coronation scene happens after that if i remember correctly uh it's actually a pretty good scene you've seen most of it if not actually all of the scene on youtube already if you haven't um the only thing that's questionable about it is because ridley scott likes to do his you know uh, license, right? I, I would say how did you know thing where you know? the pope was told that this would be happening instead of the gasping that happens and everyone being shocked it was more what well, this is what is going to happen mr pope man um so the coronation seems good. You got Austerlitz. Then we jump to Austerlitz, right? It's a bad battle recreation scene. You can't see anything. It's the same problem with, like, the batter of Winterfell. Everything is, like, dark. You can't... It's winter and dark. If you have seen the Battle of Winterfell, that's what this is, right? You can't see anything because everything is dark and you can't see anything because directors like to do that, I guess, now, right? So that's your first problem. Second problem is just battle actually on the ice when it really wasn't... There's a camp that's attacked, artillery is being hidden, and then they beat the Austrians. There's no reason. They don't show why they were beaten, where this happened, how he outflanked him. Now, skip all that, because uh, they beat them, and then they run over the ice, and then thousands of people die because cannons go through ice and make them sink, even though in reality they didn't do that, but because Ridley Scott likes to do his... You know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where you then? Then thousands of people die, so... Or at least hundreds of people die from what I saw. I mean, though historically it didn't happen, but what are you going to do there? So, after that, Emperor Francis uh, comes to meet with Napoleon. When he meets with Napoleon, uh, Tsar Alexander isn't there, right? Because the man-child that Ale man Tsar Alexander was, of course he wouldn't be there. We'll get to Tsar Alexander in a minute, because they, they, they make him better than he was in this movie. Um... So he's a little pissed about that. And then we jump to uh, him. Sorry. We, we go to the divorce scene with Josephine. Uh, that lasts a good minute, a few minutes. And then we have him slapping her, even though historians would argue that that would never happen. Again, you know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where you then? So that's all you need to know about that. So he divorces her. Then they meet with Zara Alexander to discuss the continental system. It was literally brought up the actual continental system. And when they bring that up, right? No explanation of what it is. If you're not a historian, you don't know what it is, right? Trade with the British. That's all it is mentioned, I think, in that scene. Then he tries to marry Zara Alexander's niece, I think, or sister that was 15 at the time. 
that doesn't happen. She's already betrothed. So he goes, so then it jumps to him meeting the Austrian princess Marie Louise, and she is married to Napoleon. She says 10 lines, literally 10 lines, I think. It's not even more than that. That's it. Then there's no love there, even though there was. There's no him getting a son from her and loving that family very much. Nope, it's all gone. It's all gone. Uh, then Napoleon brings the son that he had with his wife, and he shows it to Josephine, and Josephine's like, oh, yay, woo! Right? Um, then we jump to the invasion of Russia, because of course we do. Uh, when that scene happens, the Russian Cossacks actually fighting off the French is pretty good. I will that that actually had me starting to be like, oh yes, this movie can actually do some well. Yeah, the Russians doing their hit and run tactics on the uh, French as they're going into Russia, right? Um, then we have the Battle of Bordino. The whole minute that it is, not joking, it's literally a minute, where he charges into the enemy infantry, Napoleon on horseback. You can go watch the scene in the trailer. That's it. The whole battle. Then it comes up with a casualty number. That's the Battle of Bordino. You After know, I, license, I, I would say, how do you know where you're that? <laughs> then we jump to Moscow, to them arriving at Moscow. The scene's actually pretty decent with him walking up to, like, the seat of the Tsar's power in Moscow, even though ooh, the capital was St. Petersburg at this, at this point in time. He goes up there. He sits on it. He dusts everything off. It's pretty good. Then he sleeps. Then he wakes up. Moscow is burning. Like they did historically. Who's up the fire? The Russians, sir. No, they possibly couldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. And then he, they eventually get to, well, we could go to Petersburg. Sir, we don't have any supplies. Right? And I'm not joking when I say that it shows them, I believe, ru retreating from Russia for like a whole like 30 seconds. And then it jumps from 1812, 1812 to 1813 to 1814, the abdication. No Germany, no Battle of France, not Napoleon at his finest hour, nothing. Abdication. Goes to abdication, signs. After he abdicates, um, Josephine historically died when he was in exile on Elba, because Napoleon gets exiled to Elba. Historically, she died in between that point and when he returned, so he already knew she was dead. But because really Scott likes to do, you know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know where you that? He returns from Elba into France, and then she dies in the same scene. He gets there, nobody informed me. Blah blah blah. He breaks down in tears. Then after that, we don't get anything. Um, actually, so he returns to France. They do the scene from Waterloo, it's done very badly, where Marshal Ney is sent there to stop him with a whole platoon of guys, like not even 40-something dudes, and he doesn't do the, if you may shoot your emperor, if you must. He does that, the army like, woo, yay, woo, we'll join you. Right, he's, he's not even a charismatic dude, it's like the only point in the time, only point in the whole movie where you actually see the army actually interact with Napoleon at any point. Woo! So after that happens, uh, he goes visit Josephine. She's dead. He loses his mind. Then we s jump over to like the Congress of Vienna that's happening, where everyone's like, oh my god, Napoleon has landed. And then in that scene, you actually have King Louis, Arthur Wellesley, Talleyrand, Alexander, and everyone else. It doesn't show their names. It doesn't tell you who they are. They're just there, and you're supposed to know who they are. Right. That, I think, happens when he lands and before Josephine. Look, it doesn't really matter. It's all convoluted at the same point. Then, after that point, Waterloo. The whole pinnacle of the movie. Waterloo happens. Yeah. So, skipping all of the, the everything that led up to Waterloo. Not even mentioning the Prussians. Nope. Not even mentioning Marshal Grouchy. None of that. We get there, and we must wait till the ground dries. As it is literally pouring rain. We must wait till the ground dries. 
as it's pouring rain in the scene. It doesn't like just magically stop either. It keeps raining for a while. And then somehow the battle commences and the rain just stops, even though it's supposed to be a whole, even though it was supposed to happen the day before it rained, so it was muddy. You know, uh, I, I would say, how did you know where you then? Love it, Ridley Scott. Anyway, there are trenches like it's World War One, like it's 1917, because of course there are. The British must come out of their trenches, right? Uh, to advance on the French. Um, they actually have... Uh, they did this in Waterloo, too, where... May I take a shot, sir? Except with... In Waterloo, the original movie, that's with a cannon, and a horse artillery cannon person was saying that because he was too far away for a rifle to hit. And this, it's a scoped 95th rifleman with an actual scope. It's very jarring on uh, his rifle saying, Hey, may I take the shot? And they're like, No. And then he shoots Napoleon in the hat. At some point in the battle, he shoots Napoleon in the hat, which, again, you know, uh, license, I, right? I would say, how did you know? Even though we that? have Napoleon's hat and there's no bullet hole in it, right? <sighs> then we have the Battle of Waterloo, where basically what happens is the French fire artillery, the British take cover, the British advance, get into square formation, the cavalry charge under Ney, then that doesn't work. Then Ney retreats. Then Napoleon tells his old guard to go in, I believe. They get beat back. The scene ends with him running away. Now, why this battle doesn't work for Waterloo? The whole battle has no CGI because Ridley Scott hates CGI. The reason he hates CGI is because he doesn't like it. The problem is, when you have only, like, not even 100 dudes... It feels tiny. The battle for Waterloo felt tinier in scale than the Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones. If you go watch the Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones, that is a bigger scene than Waterloo. And that battle specifically only had a few thousand men in it in the Battle of the Bastards. Whereas Waterloo had tens of thousands of people. And it still felt smaller because no CGI. Can't have that because Ridley Scott, right? No AI too. So let's just say that that battle was not good. Then we just jump to Napoleon on a ship. And he's talking with a whole bunch of cadets from, or midshipmen actually, uh, on a British warship. And he meets Sir Arthur Wellesley because... You know, I, I would say, how did you know where you Even though historically they'd never met, right? Ever. But really, Scott does what he wants. It's not even... I don't remember what they said. I, I believe they talked about it for like five seconds and then they jump, right? Then you get to Napoleon in exile um, on St. Helena. And then he sits in a chair... And quite frankly, Josephine is calling to him. He talks to two girls. And then he just slumps over and dies. Because that's historically accurate. Then that is it, Finn. Except we're not done yet. Because meanwhile, during the credits, uh, it tells you the total of people that died under Napoleon trying to make him out to be a monster. Right? When you could theoretically argue from 1792 all the way to 1802 with the First and Second Coalition that France was fighting a war for survival, right? Because it was a republic, republic, against a whole bunch of monarchies. And they wanted that thing dead because they couldn't allow that to happen. You, so you could argue that for 10 years it was a defensive war. You could argue the Third Coalition is a defensive or offensive and, you know, go from there. But make him out to be a, a, like a monster, because the British must win. I can see why all the people in France are mad about this movie, right? So, that's all of Napoleon's storyline wrapped up. So you want me to tell you uh, what we missed, right? So, main conflicts that we skipped. All of Italy. All of Egypt. I don't count the one cannonball into the pyramid as a anything. We skipped all of Germany, the Confederation of the Rhine. All of those battles. All Nope. We have some bits of Russia, which is basically bored to know if you even count that battle, which is a minute. Then you have the retreat from Russia, which is not a retreat, doesn't show the hardship they went through, doesn't show how Ney earned his name, right? Saving his guys. Nope. 
If all the battles from 1814, 1812 to 1814, they're all gone. There's no Battle of France in 1814, which, in my opinion, was Napoleon's best, him at his best, right? Um, all gone. The only battles that are actually shown, the Siege of Toulon, the 13th of uh, Vendemer, if you really count that a battle, it's not really. You have the Battle of the Pyramids, right? Austerlitz, Bordino, for the whole minute it's on screen, Waterloo. That's it. It's not like the four-hour version of this movie is going to add some battles in that weren't there. And even if they did, it wouldn't make this whole movie better, right? So, I hope you guys like my rant, or whatever this was. Because, again, we have to answer the four questions of why it failed. One, its storyline was not interesting. It jumps all, all over the places. I think I've covered that very quite well in just how the storyline was structured. Two, tries to cover too much in one movie. We've gone over that. Three, it fails to make people interested in Napoleon. Does Napoleon sound like a very interesting character where he was just whining all the time about Josephine and beat a few people and then lost and abdicated and then died in a chair, slumped over? No. The historical inaccuracies at four have covered all of them that I could cover that I even wanted to mention. There are plenty more you could go through, but... And that's why this movie failed. Failed in the box office... I don't feel like I ever want to watch this movie again. And that's a really sad thing about Napoleon, right? Like, it's a meh movie. Like, I'm not going to go see it. You go see Angry Joe's review of this movie? It's the same thing. It's like, meh, it's okay. Probably won't go see it again, though. Don't want to learn about Napoleon. None of that. Don't walk out of the theater being like, yes, I want to go play Empire Total War or Napoleon Total War. Nope. I really hope that another movie about Napoleon is made, but we probably all know that that's not going to be true. Um, yeah. So hope you guys like that rant. Leave a like, leave a comment, especially I do want to know actually what you guys are thinking. Otherwise I'll see you guys next time and have a good rest of your day and just don't go out and see Napoleon.